Well, we're working on it. We're getting there. Step by step, we're covering these very important topics, starting with identifying those best equity asset classes, moving on to work showing the different combinations of equity asset classes and what that does to risk and what that does to return. And then we moved on to combining those different equity asset classes with fixed income to see what happens when you try to stabilize from an all equity portfolio. And then we looked at the accumulation phase of our life when we're saving for retirement. And now we're in it. Now we have reached the point where we have some amount of money we're going to live off of that amount of money plus income that we have from other sources. And the question arises, how should we invest in retirement? How much in stocks? How much in bonds? Uh, what should the equity portion, what kind of stocks are we talking? Large cap, small cap, value, growth, U.S., international. And then we're asking how much should we take out? What would be comfortable for us to take out? Now, we, thanks to Daryl, we have tables. We have tables for almost every occasion. <laughs> and that is for people who want to take out three, four, five, six percent. And in this particular presentation, we're going to be talking about the people who, by my definition, have retired with what they think is enough. On the next video and podcast that we do, we'll be talking about a way of taking out, which is called the flexible or variable strategy for people who have saved more than enough. But for this people, this group of people that qualify, for what I call the enough, these people are going to need to keep up with inflation. So we're not only going to take money out, but we're going to inflation adjust those distributions. So before I dig into all the numbers, I would love Daryl to walk us through how he put these tables together and, uh, and and I think this will be very important because I do think that Daryl has taken care of almost all of the things we'd be concerned about, but one, and we'll talk about that later. Daryl, go ahead, man. Tell us, tell us how you put these together. Okay, thanks, Paul. Well, these tables are based on the returns for each of the nine different portfolios from the fine tuning tables and uh, annual returns from the fine tuning tables. Uh, they assume that you start out on the first year of your retirement or your distribution phase with a million dollars. And then at the beginning of the year, you take out whatever amount you happen to decide on. This table we're showing here is 3% or $30,000 a year or uh, for a, based on a million dollars. Then, uh, and you take that out at the beginning of the year, then it's grow. And then uh, the next year, as Paul mentioned, you adjust for inflation and then take that amount out at the beginning of the year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in this specific case, we started out with a million dollars. We took out $30,000 a year, 3% here. Um, and if you look at the, let's use the 50-50 here as an example. So it's based on the fine tuning tables. So if you go back and look at the fine tuning tables for the S&P 500, the return for the 50-50 that first year was 10%. So in the first year, we had a million dollars. We took out $30,000. That left us with $970,000 at the beginning of the year. It grew by by uh, 10%, and then we ended up at the end of the year with, with, with $1,067,000 roughly. Then we inflate that by 5.5%, which means next year we take out $31,671. 
that keeps going on and on and on. And as you follow this through the 53 years, at the end of 53 years, if you're lucky enough to have a 53-year retirement, <laughs> you will have taken out $6,378,533, summing all these distributions up. So that represents a real amount based on your initial year. Because these are, these are nominal dollars, but they're inflated. So they're $30,000 real every year. I think these are taken out of the beginning of the year. I think that's about it. It's really a fairly simple process, straightforward process. So, um, and then this is done for several different thrall rates, three, four, five, six, as Paul mentioned, and then for each of the nine different portfolios. Daryl, that, that's it, Paul. That's great. No, that's that's beautiful. And and I think the uh, the thing about this table is it gives you a sense of what life might have been like during the history of the market when it started, for example, in the 70s with a reasonably bad market overall, although some of the asset classes came roaring back in the last uh, four or five years. Uh, and then you, you have in here the 90s, the roaring 90s, and then you have the 2000 to 2009 period. Again, a difficult, difficult time, followed by the 2010 to 2022 being very good market periods. The problem that we all face here is this is one series, one sequence of returns. And while I believe that we'll have similar returns, there'll be lots of good years, lots of bad years, lots of in-between, the way they flow will not be the same. That, that is virtually guaranteed uh, to, to be different. And so some of us will retire uh, into very good markets, some of us into very bad markets. And one of the nice things about this particular table is that you really could, if you wish, look at decade periods. But the things that I look at when I'm trying to get my arms around all these numbers, and I know it's a lot of numbers, but in essence, there really are only a couple numbers that you need to make sure that you see. I like to look at the all equity portfolio. I, not that I'm recommending the all equity portfolio, the line that says 100% equity, but I like to look at it because I know equities are risky. And the question I have, if somebody decides to be all equity, what will happen when they run into a period like 74 and 75? Because those were big drops in the market. And by the end of 1974, your million dollars is now down to 760000 And I wonder how many couples would be able to stay the course. You might have one investor who's very aggressive and a spouse who is not. Uh, and while that is happening, the cost of living has gone up because uh, in 1974, the cost has gone from 30,000 to 36, almost $37,000. And when we look then at the 50-50 strategy, which would be much less risky, we can see that in that 73, 74 period, that while you had a, a lost money from 73 to 74, you ended 1974 with more money than you started. Now that is not necessarily great, but at, 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 at least it's not a loss at that point. It's interesting how people perceive that they have a loss. They typically think in terms of from the beginning, not from the previous year. But then we make our way down, and I don't even know that I would encourage you to go all the way to the bottom of the page, because as Daryl mentioned, 53 years is uh, pr uh, probably uh, not a, a logical. By the way, for somebody retiring at age 40, 53 years is a legitimate period of time, if not even more. And I think looking out 30 years is meaningful. Yes, it does take into a bad 70s, 
a decent 80s and a decent 90s. But I want you to look out there 30 years and notice the difference between what you would have in the 50-50 strategy, about almost $11 million uh, in 1999. Uh, and if we go over to uh, look at where we'd be with 100% equity, you'd have 60 some percent more with $16 million. Now, or, or I, I guess, yeah, six, there we go. And, and that's a big difference. Maybe not if you are actually sticking to the plan uh, and taking out that adjusted amount, because you'll notice that year while you're sitting on a lot of money, you only took out $130,000. So, so obviously, these numbers are not the way the real world works, because I suspect you'd be taking out more money. But I we do it this way because there, there, there's no other way to, to do it. You'll see a different set of tables next week when we talk about the flexible and variable distributions than you see here. But this is the way it would have worked. And to the extent that, in fact, you make it out 53 years, the bottom line numbers, of course, are huge, whether it's the 53 million for the S&P 500 uh, all in equities or the 27 million for the 50-50. Those are huge numbers. And the thing we have to understand is that those numbers are nothing more but the impact of compounding. And you might ask, is there anything really, truly, measurably unusual about that particular period of time? Well, the compound rate of return was 10.4%. And the, the compound rate of return since 1928, I think, is around 9.9%. So, Yes, it was a half a percent better maybe than that long-term return, but it, it isn't typically you know out, out of out of average because the average 40-year return has been 11 percent approximately uh, since 1928. So this gives you a lot of data. And I would say, that if you only take out $30,000, it feels pretty safe no matter where you went. Now, with the S&P 500 by itself getting down to 760000 that might be the turning point there. But if you were all in fixed income, you can see the fixed income, even with the adjustment in, uh, infl with inflation, held up and you had money for a lifetime. Not bad, but the final number, whether you look out 30 years or 53 years, is nothing like the 50-50 or the 40-40 or the 30-70, the 40-60, I should say. So that's a view. And that is assuming you want to start with a 3% extraction. Then as we go to the next page, and instead of taking out 30000 everything else is exactly the same. Instead of uh, uh, the same equities, the same fixed income, the only thing, oh, and the same inflation, the only thing is that $10,000 difference and what happens to that as it is impacted by inflation. And I want you to notice something pretty remarkable. Number one, that distribution of 30,000 that grew to, I don't remember what it was, uh, 200 and something. Uh, in fact, I could even look here, give me a, a moment. Um, 221 now grows to uh, 200 and I think $95,000. That is a big increase, but that is the impact of adding just $10,000. Now, again, you're going to have these choices. Are you going to because you're taking more out? Should that suggest that you should be more conservative? Well, maybe. You might think that way. 
Or do you need to be more aggressive because you're taking more out? You could think that way as well. But I want you to notice that the bottom line impact is really big. Let's look at the 50-50. Uh, instead of before, we had $27 million. Now the 50-50 ends with $6.6 .6 million. So your desire to spend more had a huge impact on what you left to others. Uh, and by the way, is that bad? I, I, I don't know that I would consider that bad. I mean, the idea here is not just to uh, to make other people wealthy, but to enjoy your savings over a lifetime. And the 100% equity ends with about 8.8 .8 million versus about 53 million. So what you might have thought of as a very small decision to go from 30 to 40,000, after all, you're doing this with a million dollars, what could an extra $10,000 hurt? And by the way, let's look out 30 years, just for the, the sake of discussion with the 100% equity, you're at 6.4 million versus about 16 million. With the 50-50, you're at 5.4 million versus 10.9 million. So whether we look out 30 years or 53 years, the bottom line is you're going to leave less. You're going to enjoy more. Now, as with everything in life, enjoying more at some point can be risky. And when we go to the next page, we see that risk loud and clear. Because when we go to a 50,000 extraction rate and adjust for inflation, after about 30 years or less, we're basically broke. Now, people aren't going to sit there and just allow themselves to go broke. Most of them will not. Most of them will change their lifestyle. So to that extent, I understand uh, this is not a, a necessarily a meaningful table in terms of the reality of what you would live through, because there is some point here at which we quietly move in with our children, or we do something that means spending less money. But that small change, but again, when you have a million and you go from 30 to 40 or 40 to 50, it doesn't sound like you're on the road to bankruptcy. But it could be. Now, remember, you are starting with the first 10 years being very unfriendly. And what you don't see here in this table, in fact, let's go back one, Daryl, to the $40,000 extraction rate, if we can, because I want to look at that period from 1999 through 2009. And uh, you will see that at the end of, two, of 1999, with the all equity, you had 6.4 million. And by the end of the next 10 years, you had 3.7 million. So there would have been another very unfriendly period to have, uh, have started. And so I could say that there were two out of the five periods here that uh, I, I, I would rather have chosen something else uh, in order to start out ahead. It is always easier in the long run when we start out with the good times. Uh, with, let's, go, let's go forward, if you can there, Daryl, to the $60,000 a year. I know, you know what that means. That means you're going to be broke sooner. So all I want to say here is that for people who retire with enough, who have not oversaved, I want you to see uh, what the implications are of that. Because when we look next week at the returns of the flexible or variable distribution rates, you are going to see that indeed you will be able to take out 5% of the beginning amount and or even 6%
of the beginning amount and not likely uh, face a bankruptcy. And we'll show you how easy that is. And I'll just give you a clue that it has something to do with oversaving. Now, you, when you made this decision, you had to decide how much in equity, how much in fixed income. Remembering that that fixed income is going to lower the volatility and uh, it will likely uh, uh, leave you with less money for your heirs. On the other hand, if you do go through a tough period like you might see here with the S&P 560,000, notice those that had more bonds in it lasted longer. So bonds help it sustain difficult periods and cut down the volatility. But then the other decision you are going to make, and it is huge, as you will see, the other decision is to go to a different equity exposure. So just for the sake of this discussion, as you know, we have nine different equity combinations that, that we show in our tables. But let's go on to a combination of the four U.S. Uh, equity asset classes, 25% each, and very close to the S&P 500 in many ways. Uh, and let's look at that. Now, let's look here at the beginning point where we started with 30,000. And what I notice in looking at my numbers is the S&P 500 in a 100% a position as the equity ended with some of $54 million approximately. Here we end up with 100 and uh, it looks like 85,000. Uh, my glasses are a little, my eyes are not as good as they used to be and these numbers are small, but I see it, it's a big number. And I also see the 50-50 strategy that before ended up with 27 million, ended up with 58, uh, yes, 58 million. So this is a big decision. And for those who are not aware of the four fund strategy, one of the things I always hope people will do is they'll watch this series that we're working on uh, in the order that we recorded it. And the first, the first part of the series had to do with looking at all the different equity asset classes and then one of those ways to put them together was this combination of these four long-term successful equity asset classes, but with 25% each instead of the S&P 500. And you go back and look at that information, you may even conclude, as I do, that the risk that you take over the long term with the four fund strategy is no more risky over the long term than the S&P 500. You look at the numbers and uh, we'll have a link to that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, those portfolios uh, in, in the notes to this, uh, to this video. So there you go as you look at the first of these uh, by the way, where you look at the 100% bonds, you got the same story, nothing different going on there. But as you move to the right, whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% equity, those numbers are, are much bigger than with the S&P 500. All right, dear, let's move on and look at the 40% uh, percent, $40,000 distribution. And uh, there we go. You'll notice just as before, you don't uh, have as much money at the end of the period of time. Now you're down to $110,000 million uh, with 100% equity. And with the 50% equity, you're down to about 30, $31 million. So a lot less money, but a lot more money for you to live on. And as we go to the 50%, it's not magic, or the, I'm sorry, the $50,000 distribution to start with. You'll notice it, it isn't magic, but it does make it to the bottom of the page or for more years than with the S&P 500. 
In fact, you can see the all equity S&P 500 was out of money in about 1992, whereas the 100% equity still had money in it uh, at the end of that year with about $3.8 million. I know that would feel better. Uh, we always are hoping the future will look like the past. It would make it an easy decision, but we never know for sure. And when we move on to the $60,000 extraction, we will see some of the more of uh, some more, but but fewer years that it makes it to the uh, uh, to well didn't make it to the bottom in any combination. So again, I think you'll be very interested in next next week's presentation because you're going to see these things all going to the bottom in every case. So, Chris, I know you're sitting there. I know you're watching this, and I know that we've talked about these tables, I will call it endlessly. It must feel like endlessly over the years. And uh, I, I know what we're trying to do here in educating people about the decision when they in retire with enough and not more than enough. But you always have some sage comments. What are some of your thoughts about these tables as, as you think about their usefulness? Well, I don't know if I can come up with anything sage. We'll see what we can do here. <laughs> to me, sage is a, a brush that uh, <laughs> grows in the desert. So maybe I can rise to that standard. Um, one thing I noticed back on the S&P 500 with the 5 and 6% withdrawal rates is that uh, they ran out of money early, but I, I think... And Daryl, you can tell me if I'm going down the wrong path here. I think if you started at a different point in time, you might get a different answer. So those no, scenarios tell you, oh, the safest thing to do is be heavy in bonds. But I think if you did a start date that was 10 or 20 years later, it, the picture might actually look quite different. The safest start or the safest thing to use might actually be more equities. And so I, I thought that was worthwhile calling out just so people don't get Good the wrong point. idea. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah, what you're talking about is sequence of returns. Yeah. And, and yes, this is one sequence. And uh, there are an infinite number of sequences. And even within this sequence, if you if you started a decade later and ran for 30 years, it, it would be different. You started 20 years later and ran for 30 years, it would be different. Uh, so yeah, I think the I think the lesson to take maybe not so much how does one individual uh, portfolio and withdrawal rate work, but how how resilient or how how do they differ from one portfolio and withdrawal rate to a different portfolio and withdrawal rate? They won't be the same, but but they might give you an indication of how, how resilient you can be uh, with respect to your asset allocation and your withdrawal rate. Excellent point, Daryl. And if I can add to that, one of the things I think we see that is a valid lesson in the charts we just went through is that the meaningful diversification you get with a portfolio like the ultimate buy and hold or what we showed which was the us4 fund portfolio gives you a higher safe withdrawal rate in retirement and that's why more of them make it to the bottom for these fixed income equity combos and that higher safe withdrawal rate makes them more resilient it makes them safer so that diversification even though it might come along with uh, a little bit higher volatility i uh, say so you have to be just slightly more disciplined in waiting it out if you do wait it out it's good for you because not only do you get the higher return but you also get the the higher the the greater resilience the protection against sequence of returns risk uh, the last comment is just it's it's one that always strikes me as you go through these various scenarios and that's that as investors we all as we manage our money and our resources through our lifetime have an opportunity to spiral up or spiral down the investor who has saved just enough and has to be more conservative than in the allocation of their assets and more conservative in the distribution strategy that they use 
has a lower number at the bottom of the chart and a lower total number of dollars that they're able to take out. Somebody who has oversaved and can take and we'll see this in the variable distribution strategies next week, but can take a little bit more risk in the way the portfolio is allocated and a little bit uh, more flexibility in how the money comes out during retirement. It ends up with a bigger number at the bottom. And so there's, it, there's this, it's almost like there's a tipping point in your life and you can either be to the left where you spiral down, or you can try to be just right at the, the tipping point or you can oversave and find yourself in a position where things get more comfortable. I, I've heard Warren Buffett interviewed uh, where he very humbly replied to the accusation of being a great investor saying, no, I just started early. You know, when you start as a teenager and you're, you've been educated and you know how to do these things and you know how to live below your means, you're going to end up in a very wealthy spot. That That's a great quote. And you know, something, I'm not the right one to do this, but Chris, would would you or Daryl take on a little discussion about how these tables might be used with the lifetime calculator on our website? Uh, I'll I'll take it quickly, Daryl. Maybe you can add something. In the lifetime investment calculator, you can go in and pick one of these portfolios, pick an equity fixed income allocation, and then put in some assumptions about your cash flow, you know, whether you're in a withdrawal phase or an accumulation phase. And rather than being restricted to the numbers that are in the table, which run for the full 53 years of history, you can look at a shorter number of years of history and you can change when it starts. You can try different start dates. And uh, so you can, using that calculator, learn a lot more than you can just looking at the tables in a fairly short period of time. And I, I, I mean, props to, uh, um, and now I'm blitzing on his name. Craig. <laughs> Craig, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Props to Craig for, uh, that, it, it, Paul's talked about the things that happen to an older mind. For me, it's forgetting <laughs> me. <laughs> but props to Craig for creating that and uh, making just an incredibly useful tool. And there's one more thing he does with that that I think is, is uh, marvelous is you can adjust the returns upward or downward. So if you have a sense that that uh, return on the S&P 500 was higher than it's likely to be for the next 30 years, you can actually reduce it by 1% and everything in the calculator will change by that 1% reduction uh, in the return. So, uh, and Daryl, is there anything else you could think of that comes out of that Calculator. What about oh, the? Ability? I, Go I ahead. think I think Craig's calculator is is a a wonderful way to explore the data to to roll around in the data, so to speak, and and get comfortable and familiar with it, and and learn these different lessons about start dates and return rates and and what happens if things don't pan out as well as as maybe they have appeared to have been able to pan out in the past. Um. I think what about what about moving it's from, a fantastic tool? Yeah, what about moving from over time, like every 10 years, from one combination of equity fixed income into another combination? How much work is that with with the calculator? I believe you can do it, but I think there's a, a pencil and paper interface a little bit, if you will, where you have to have to kind of bite it off one chunk at a time, one decade at a time. So you need to readjust your your inputs, I think, for subsequent decades. I'm not I'm not quite sure how that works. Are you more familiar with that, Chris? Uh, no, no, I would I'd have to go dig into it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well I think you're right. You you go for the 10 years, then you start over and you put that new data in as a starting point. But it but it can be done. It's just a, it's a, a little bit of manual work, and I know that that many of the users are doing that. Well, uh, I, I hope, and and in fact, uh, before I say I hope anything, I want to share a conversation the three of us have had. In fact, uh, uh, that I just this morning also had with Rich Buck, and that is the overwhelming nature of all of these numbers. 
uh, we are trying our best to create uh, information, data that can be manipulated so that you can determine what decisions to make in terms of risk, in terms of uh, how you build the equity portion of the portfolio, which would have something to do with maybe when you retire and, and how much you take out. All these things are important, but are these tables overwhelming? Because here we have uh, two sets of tables for two portfolios. There are another seven based like this with in the ta- in the case of the worldwide portfolios are 50-50, but that doesn't even include the set of numbers where the worldwide portfolios are 70% US and 30% international. So another set of tables that you can access. I've always thought that, well, in fact, I know that when I was an advisor and I used these tables, I tried to sort through who the person was, and then I went right to the table that I thought represented their risk tolerance and would meet their needs for return. Uh, Now we're asking you to be the advisor and advising yourself. Are these tables helping? And what more could we do? Because we continue to to work on how to make uh, future educational uh, uh, videos uh, and podcasts and articles uh, better. You know, you can, whether you want to email to Paul at paulmerriman.com. I know a lot of you contact Chris and and some have contacted Daryl. I'm not asking them to put their email addresses here, but I but I am more than happy to get some feedback on how you view this work and whether or not it really has an impact on your decision making. And I know I'm going to get some good response from engineers. Uh, I have to chuckle because I've talked to engineers lately, not knowing they're engineers, but I asked them after I've talked with them for a few minutes, by the chance, are you an engineer? And they'll say yes in every case. They said yes. <laughs> then I ask them a little, a strange question: uh, Are you, you know, basically a thin person? Uh, are you, are you fit? And in every case, they've said yes. Now I'm not suggesting that every engineer is fit. I am suggesting that these are people who generally are evidence-based, try to live by a set of guidelines that are somehow based on numbers. I, on the other hand, am not an engineer, and and I have not <laughs> lived my life on always doing the right thing. But where do you fit? How are these tables helping you? Paul at paulmerriman.com. I promise I'll read everyone. I'm not promising I'll respond, but I promise I will read them. And if you guys don't have anything extra to add, we will call it a day. And thank you. Thank you both very much. And uh, and in the notes, by the way, with this video are lots of links to things that we commented on. You know that it's helpful if you like these, these presentations. We know that it's helpful if you send them forward to others and suggest that they subscribe. In fact, we, it's also helpful if you actually subscribe uh, to these. And no salesperson is going to call, but it does help when the subscription base is larger. So thanks to you all for what you do to help us. And we'll keep uh, coming back to help you. And next week, we're coming back with, I think, some very interesting information on the use of the variable or flexible distribution strategies. See you then.